Our minds and our hearts are both sacred. Faith and science, doubt and belief serve the pursuit of truth. Join us for Evolving Universe, Evolving Faith, a Darkwood Brew series produced in collaboration with the Adler Planetarium in Chicago and the Clergy Letter Project. We're exploring how current scientific theories on creation and the evolution of the universe, quantum theory, and the human body itself reawaken our spiritual imagination more robustly than any time since the Enlightenment. Please join us on this exciting journey. He walked by on the other side, leaving the man helpless. But then, who should wander by but a Samaritan of all people? And he actually helped the man. Hang on, Master. No, he did. He went over and actually... No, sorry. No, no, no. I, I mean, this is what I'm saying. That a Samaritan, all right, so have a good think about your attitudes, went and helped. Yeah, no, I see. No, no, no stick with it. Because what I'm saying is that he was a good Samaritan. That's good Samaritan, if you could imagine such a thing. Yes! Yes, I can. I, I think we all can. Yeah. I, I know there's a lot of prejudice against Samaritans, which is terrible. But I'm sure I speak for everyone in this room when I say that there are loads of really nice Samaritans. Yeah, some of my best friends are Samaritans. <laughs> yeah, me and the wife went on holiday to Samaria last year and they were lovely people. Yeah, couldn't do enough for you. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what I'm finding offensive, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, mm. is your unreflecting acceptance of this cliché that all Samaritans are wankers. No, I'm saying he was good. Yeah, but you're implying that the fact that he was good is worth a story in itself. It's some kind of weird curiosity, like an albino Nubian. No, I'm saying that goodness comes in unexpected places. Yeah, and I'm saying that the fact that you wouldn't expect goodness from a Samaritan betrays your inherent racism. <laughs> OK, OK, all right, that's a big word. Let's just take a deep breath here. Uh, I didn't mean to offend anybody. That's the last thing I intended. Um, I didn't realise there were any Samaritans in the room. No, that's not the point. Or Samaritan sympathisers, you know, Sammy lovers. Oh, I can't believe I'm hearing this. No, 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 I, I didn't realise it was such a PC environment here, and I suppose I thought that having what was only intended as a fond pop at our Samaritan neighbours, friends even, if you like, would not be inappropriate in the context of a story which is, after all, about goodness. And at the end of the day, it is only a parable. What, it didn't really happen? Well, of course not. A Samaritan tosser wouldn't do that for his own grandmother. Oh, Jesus <laughs> Christ! Jesus. What? <laughs> oh, my. Hi, welcome to Darkwood Brew, where ancient Christian mystical practice is blended with modern interactive web technology, world-class jazz, arts, biblical scholarship, and, well, you never know exactly what's going to happen. If you're joining us for the first time, you've joined us for part five of our six-part series, For the Love of God, Civil Conversation on the Bible and Homosexuality. Part of our broader uh, uh, themed uh, set of series, uh, discussion on convergence Christianity called By This Way of Life. Thus far in our series, we have been asking, what does it mean to have a biblical faith? and be open and affirming of LGBT persons in church and society. We've dealt with the hard texts that challenge uh, this point of view and also suggested some texts that, that point beyond it to a more inclusive uh, stance within uh, the Christian community. Uh, starting this week, though, we're going to also be turning to the gospel written in flesh and blood, considering real people who are most centrally uh, affected by the church's discussion with respect to equality for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. Tonight is a special episode in which we're featuring two guests that you may not predict would come on Darkwood Brew. They are openly gay, and uh, one is openly Catholic, that is Sue Fulton, who was among the first female graduating class of West Park Point Military Academy and serves on the, uh, the board of visitors for, for West Point at the direct uh, uh, appointment of Barack Obama and also serves as a, on the board of directors of Knights Out, a collection of West Point graduates who are committed to supporting LGBT persons who are serving as openly gay persons in the, or LGBT in the military. And our second guest is an evangelical gay Christian. His name is Justin Lee, and he's the head of the Gay Christian Network uh, nationally, and also has just published an incredible book uh, called Torn, 
rescuing the gospel from the gays versus, versus Christians debate. We're going to be asking these two uh, how this issue affects them. What was their uh, struggle with their own sexual orientation and what happened when they came out and uh, what is going to point the way forward in this discussion. We're looking very much forward to having them on in this special uh, double episode of Darkwood Brew. But before we go any further, let's take a look at what happened last week. How long before we feel joy? People think I'm a heretic because of this one belief that I have, and I guess I don't care what people say. I don't care, because I know that calling is so deep within me. I've been a Christian for 25 years, and I, I know what the Holy Spirit power and conviction and talking to me feels like. I know what that feels like, and I could not turn my back on this one. I, it's not even possible that I could. And then suddenly we all saw a vision. I started to laugh and I went into a trance. I could smell some familiar funkiness in, in the sheet music. And I, I was just too happy and we all were just relieved. And Chuck walked me through everything really carefully and he said, I'm going to watch you in these mirrors and I'm going to watch myself because I look real good. When we read that piece from the message, did you hear how many times God is referred to in those few verses? God, 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 Jesus, Jesus, God, Jesus, Jesus, God, 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 God. <laughs> Could you repeat it that? It really isn't all about us. Yeah, God, 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 God. It really isn't all about us. It really is about God. And this is a part, a very small part of Paul's letter. And those verses that have become, you know, Herculean in in, in dividing the church, they're minuscule, yeah. they're a few words. And we really, you're right, we need to remember that. This is about God, God's justice, and how God's justice is made known in the world. That's what chapter one is really moving toward. I mentioned up front that we'll be uh, turning to the gospel written on flesh and blood uh, during this episode, but we also want to look at the gospel itself and ask, uh, what did Jesus have to say about homosexuality? Uh, Chris is going to give us everything Jesus had to say about homosexuality. <laughs> I got it all right here. Okay. Ready to go. All right. All right. You just heard her say everything that Jesus has said about homosexuality <laughs> in, in uh, the Gospels, actually, Jesus is, is silent on that issue. Uh, that doesn't mean that Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. It just means that nothing was ever recorded about it in the Gospels. However, uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't Gospel texts that could be helpful in our uh, consideration of this, this issue. Uh, we're going to turn to one of those texts. In place of our normal Numa Divina reading, uh, tr you're going to hear a reading by Tracy Halverson of uh, Matthew 25. You're just going to hear it read, uh, a passage read, and then we're going to hear, or you're going to experience a, a, 
a bit of a tongue-in-cheek, but a serious paraphrasing of Luke's version of the same uh, parable, and we'll uh, have something to discuss after we hear uh, from Matthew and from Luke's version of an interesting parallel, a parable, rather. For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one, he gave five talents, another two, and to another, one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See? I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the utter darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Meet Michael. Michael is an important peacock, a ruddy, wealthy peacock. He can also be quite arrogant and sometimes very scary. Michael is about to go on a trip where he will be confirmed as a lord of all the land. Some people love this idea, others hate it. As he was preparing for the trip, Michael had an idea. Get ten of my finest servants. I want to have a word with them. 
the servants filed into Big Mike's boardroom and anxiously waited. I have a ruddy task for you, Michael boomed. Each take ten pounds and invest it. In what? Piped up one of the servants. No questions. Just go. The servants each went off and thought about what to invest Big Mike's money in. When Big Mike arrived back from his trip, he called the servants into the boardroom. Well, what did you make with my ruddy money? I made ten times what you gave me, declared Dave, the first servant. Big Mike was ecstatic and put Dave in charge of ten cities. Ryan, the next servant, made five times what he had invested and was put in charge of five cities. Edward started to sweat. He told Big Mike that he had been too scared to invest the money in case he lost it all. Big Mike hit the roof and flew into a rage. He demanded that Edward's money was given to Dave. The other servants protested, but Lord Michael said, Risk your ruddy life and get more than you ever ruddy dreamed of. And now my voice is totally and utterly wrecked. Yours sincerely, Ian Philip Jordan. So I gotta admit, when I first heard this parable, I was taken aback thinking maybe Jesus didn't write it because it's completely different than anything Jesus ever said before about inclusion and, and, and being able to turn things over and have the, the lowest of the low be brought up and the highest be brought down. And, but you've just written a piece of reflection on that that you're gonna post on a blog, right? That changes that viewpoint a bit. Yeah, it'll be up tomorrow. Yeah, we, we tend to, especially on that, the version that, that you heard from Tracy, we react, you know, because Jesus is saying, you know, get, take what even that person who's given very little, take it away and give it to another. And uh, uh, because those who have more will be given. And of course, if we, if we interpret that simply as, as a financial parable, we, we have to wonder about that. Incidentally, when, uh, when you hear about, you know, like five talents being given to a a servant or a slave, uh, one talent was the equivalent of about 16 years worth of wages in the wow. Bible. So it's, it's quite a lot of money that, that's uh, being talked about here. A lot of life energy, really. You know, uh, money is a store of, of real of value, which is directly related, related to our time and our, and our talent. And likely Jesus isn't talk, trying to talk to us about our money, but rather about our, our time and our talent. So depending on what you think you know, stands for talent in that parable, um, you know, the, the unit of money, um, really affects your, your interpretation of the parable itself. Um, but one of the ways to kind of understand where Jesus is coming from at the end of that parable is, what if, uh, for instance, grace is actually um, the, the medical, metaphorical value of, of the money? Um, and I'm not s claiming that that's the only way to interpret the parable at all. But if if you it's understand really that grace, things. yeah, if, yeah, if you understand grace to be that which Jesus is asking us to invest, then you know one, you think about the person at the end who said, "Hey, you know, I don't want to do anything with that stuff. You know, mm -hmm. you are uh, you're basically an intolerant jerk. You know, and and so if I waste it, you know, I, I'm you know yeah. I'm not going to get forgiven or anything. So I'm not going to do anything with it. You know, Jesus says, "Hey, listen." You know, those who are gracious tend to become more and more gracious uh, and graceful as they live their lives. But if you're going to reject grace, you know, as it is, um, you're not going to benefit from any of it. You, you're going to have less than nothing if you're not going to accept it for yourself and you're not going to give it to others. You'll have less than nothing. But you may wonder how this it might inform our discussion. That is probably more, more important here. And um, you, you may think about it. Any kind of issue that we faced, for instance, in the United States in the last 200 years that has challenged the existing uh, social and religious paradigms that we, na that we look back and say, you know what, that was a good and right thing to oppose that paradigm. Um, you think about what, what were those issues. There, for instance, slavery. Uh, there was the issue of, uh, of women's equality, even the issue of, of letting women uh, preach in churches. There's the issue of welcoming uh, divorcees into the full life of the church. There, uh, you know, 
all kinds of issues throughout the eight, throughout the last couple hundred years where, the, the, where society and church said it's this way, and yet we, in hindsight, we believe it was actually this way. And ahead of those times, it seems that the Holy Spirit speaks to people. Mm-hmm. And it, um, it kind of starts to whisper to people's hearts, you know what, you know, this uh, slavery, not so good. You know, or uh, keeping women out of the pulpit, you know, that's really not part of my will. And people start to respond to that internally. But there's a point before it's been accepted by the rest of society in the church where, you know, if you're going to actually stand against that prevailing attitude, any logical person has got to be saying, well, wait a minute, I'm feeling this from the Spirit, but my church and society is telling me this. And, and somebody who's a reflective person might ask that question, well, what if I'm wrong? Right. You know, what if I say, you know, slavery is bad and I need to stand up against it. We need to abolish slavery or we need to welcome divorcees into the wel- life of the church or, or, or we need to, to uh, uh, allow interracial marriage, which was still illegal up to 1967 in, in, in America. Somebody's got to ask, well, you know, what if I'm wrong? Yeah. And that is a question that was asked clear back in Jesus' day. Jesus kept calling us into a much more generous, spirited life a much more expansive life and also a much more inclusive life, as you uh, uh, observed. And you, you, you see what the, what the Pharisees are doing. You know, they're reacting against right. that. They're asking, well, and, and you know that the Pharisees, not all of them were reacting because they just simply thought he was wrong. A whole lot of them actually were very intrigued by Jesus' words. That's why they're, they're constantly inviting him to dinner. They're appearing at the late night hours, you know, asking his advice, you know, that kind of thing. Jesus hangs out with the Pharisees more than any other religious group in yeah. Judaism. So they're very intrigued, but they're very, very nervous. You know, and they're saying, well, gosh, you know, what if we go your way and we're wrong? You know, Jesus tells this parable about people who are given you know, this this understanding, a much more grace-filled understanding. And I think the whole understanding of this parable in terms of this really tells you about who God is in the midst of this parable is is much more intriguing to me because then it says, how much can you trust this God that we're talking about, this kingdom that we're trying to unfold here is about a God who includes everyone and loves everyone. So why would that be a fearful thing? Why would you worry about taking risks in that situation? And that's a totally different image of God than some of the folks at the time were thinking, and certainly folks in our time are thinking. Yeah. And I love the fact, like in Luke's version, there's ten servants, and he only gives the you know, three account, accounts of three of them. You, what, what, what about the other seven? <laughs> like, like, what about the person who honestly was trying to invest what had been given, but, but lost the money in a, in a bad investment or two? What would you rather be, the person who honestly tried to, to, to do the master's bidding and invest the money and lost it, or the servant who never tried to invest it at all? Right. Personally, I'd rather be the former servant. You know, uh, I would trust in, that, in the grace of, uh, of the master. Um, and you know, of course, that any, any of those folks who make money, I mean, anybody who, in our day who makes a lot of money tends to make investments that some of which do fabulously well and others do poorly. And so even those who uh, doubled kind of the money... Accumulation likely, of, of the, the attempts, right? Yeah, and likely they uh, lost money on certain investments and sure. gained on others. But trusting, you know, that having that baseline security of the graces graciousness and generosity of the master, they took those, those risks. Similarly, when we sense that call of the Spirit, you know, we are called to take risks um, in light of our understanding, um, even if it goes against the, the, you know, uh, you know, what, what society oftentimes will say or our church. Um, we're not supposed to do that willy-nilly, just to serve, well, it's my way and I don't need to listen to anybody. But if we've really tested this and really feel like this is the way to go, we are, we are called to take a step in that direction and also know that we could make a mistake. And so we, we're called to be humble about that and keep asking, am I headed in the right direction, oh God? You know, knowing that maybe you know, some of these investments we make of our time and our talent and our understandings uh, may turn into lousy investments, but we know they, they're good investments when they yield an increase. And that seems to be a, a principle, too, that it's not the prosperity gospel, like if you do well, you will prosper, like anybody who prospers are, is doing what God says. But the Spirit has a way of continually uh, helping us understand that you're on a good and right path. and you, you are, Your spirit is ex- expanding. Your sense of awe and wonder is expanding. Your sense of grace and humility is expanding. There is an increase in kingdom terms, if not in dollars terms. 
So in this case, when you when you think of this parable in the sense of time or talent that that God gives each one of us in creation, the gifts that we're given, um, do we risk those out in the world or do we hide them within who we are and never let people in? And, and that understanding is what we, we were talking about during our worship planning this week. And that's what led to our question of the week yeah. for our social media. And so we quoted Helen Keller and she said, security is mostly a superstition. It does not exist in nature. Avoiding danger is no safer in the long run than the outright exposure. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. So our question of the week was, where do you find it true that it is more dangerous to avoid danger or fear than to face it? Good question. And that's the question, how willing are you to take a risk? Mm -hmm. Or is it easier just to cover it up and be something that you're not? Right. We got a lot of responses, We too, did. Right? We got several responses. John Dorhauer says, conflict. In the area of conflict is where we tend to avoid the danger than, um, than to face it, mm -hmm. and yet things get worse when you do. John says, most churches work hard to ignore or avoid conflict. Facing it head on is difficult, challenging, and often painful. But when one does with skill, with hope, and with courage, and with honest integrity, it can be healing. Yeah, that's a really good point, too. I remember when I first got into ministry, the, one of the first churches I interviewed with who I, uh, offered me a job was in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And my wife and I visited, and in the course of our conversation, I asked, when was the last conflict in the church? When, when, what did you argue about last? And the entire search committee looked at each other, and they couldn't come up with anything. I knew at that moment stay way the heck away from this church. <laughs> and sure enough, within six months, they announced that their doors were closing. Um, you know, a church uh -huh. that can't argue about anything is, is a very, very dead church. And it's, it's really a shame that a lot of times, um, it, with respect to homosexuality in church life, um, a lot of clergy are very afraid uh, to, to raise that issue in the congregation, even if they're supportive of, you know, of a change right. um, for fear of conflict. And yet, you know, Sometimes we clergy need to trust our congregations a bit more, that, that, our, our, that our people are there because they want to be challenged and expanded, not simply have their own points of view always uh, confirmed. And that actually when there's a good and right sp and gracious spirit behind it, conflict always leads to a good thing when it's buttressed with a generosity of spirit. And clergy are in the same situation that most people are when they're bucking society's understanding of stuff or even the religious institutions of things in the sense that they have to trust that God is in that conversation as well. Absolutely. And that God is that gracious giver and not um, someone who's going to punish you for all hell and damnation. It's not all about us, huh? It's not, it's not about a God, 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 God. <laughs> Becky Lowry added to our conversation, and she says, based on what I am journeying through at this moment, avoiding danger, fear, means avoiding vulnerability. And it means isolating ourselves from others. Security is a myth, and when we try to create it, we stop taking risks, and we stop allowing ourselves to be seen by others. Mm. I thought that was really insightful, the vulnerability aspect of it, where you would hide who you were created to be by God and not share that with the world and not be what one of my favorite passages in that and that verse is entering the joy of the master. Yeah. I mean, how can you enter the joy of the master if you're hiding yourself in a cave somewhere? Good point. So that was an interesting prospect. David Greer says, when it comes to loving your neighbor as yourself, far too many people t try to hide that. And it's very scary, threatening, dangerous when the neighbor is holding a cardboard sign. Hmm. So there are lots of people who protest that, that speak out very loudly and what they think are the very right things to do. And if you disagree with that, it's very hard to come out and say, I'm not really quite with you on this. I mean, what happens if I'm wrong? Yeah, they disagree yeah. For you, with you or they're asking for money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Payne says, financial security is a big deal. Mm. Being a good steward is one part. My line of work is rife with layoffs. Facing this with continuously working on marketable skills, emergency funds, and networking is safer than assuming the layoff will not happen. So he's saying that in that case, a lot of people will say, well, that won't happen to me. Right. I have one of my favorite comic strips are two leaves on a tree, and the one leaf falls off in the, f in the autumn and falls down, and the other leaf looks back and says, well, that won't happen to me. I jog. <laughs> 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 so, 
So hiding from the eventuality mm. of things or from the inevitability of things yeah. in, in creation is not really the way to go. But that theology of the cross calls us through the cross and mm. into the grace of God. And yeah. I think that's what he's calling for there. Mitzi Cardona is the last one we have a slide for. She says, I believe that security translates to not taking risks. We live our lives in what we perceive as a safe mode and never take the risks that would lead us to experience our lives to the fullest. That speaks to me to that, that idea that if we want to participate in where God is in the world, in the utter grace and the joy and the wonder that God creates in the world, then we have to take risks. We have to come out of, of our fear that God is going to punish us somehow and live in the joy of the master yeah. rather than yeah. hiding. It's amazing. When we take a, a risk on God's grace, especially when we become most fully alive, I think, mm -hmm. in this world, we're not called to be un, uh, comfortable Christians. Uh, Taking but, uh, the risk is not trusting um, yourself to be right all the time. It's trusting that God loves you even when mistakes happen. Yeah, which is itself a, a form of, of deep humility. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, it's thanks. That's good a, conversation. Yeah, good, good stuff, yeah. Well, I hope you'll join us uh, during the week on, uh, on Facebook. That's where a lot of that discussion takes place, and also on our blogs. We've got a number of great bloggers who have been uh, putting up uh, posts almost every day uh, during this series, during the weekdays. And so uh, join us at the Darkwood Room blog on, on our site. And also while you're on the site, if you wouldn't mind uh, uh, hitting that Donate button, um, that, that helps keep Darkwood Brew alive and well. And right now we have a matching grant of $25,000, so all those matches... Uh, if you were to donate $10 a month, they will match that to $120 uh, as a $120 gift, uh, as, assuming that it will go all year. So uh, thank you, those of you who have contributed. And if you haven't yet, if you wouldn't mind uh, considering that, if we've been helpful to you, uh, we really appreciate that opportunity to be um, here and joining you in the world community exploring the emerging edges of Christian faith together. Well, we're going to turn uh, next to uh, Sue Fulton for, as our first Skype guest. But before we do, we want to simply take a moment now uh, recognizing that we are not simply a, an internet broadcast or a coffee house gathering, but a spiritual gathering of people who are uh, looking for direction from the Holy Spirit. We invite you to, as, the, as music plays over the next minute, to simply take a deep breath in, let it out slowly. And in so doing, clear away whatever obstacles you may have brought with you to experiencing the presence of God in our time together this evening. Let's simply uh, spend the next minute opening ourselves to that presence of the Holy Spirit. Well, Sue, it's great to have you uh, with us this evening. Thanks, Eric. I'm happy to be here. You're just hot off a plane from a, a conference in Atlanta, I understand. 
That's right. Yeah, but uh, but I'm here now. <laughs> yeah, great. And I I, I guess I. You, neither you nor Justin Lee knew it, but you were actually attending the same conference together. The Creating Change Conference. Yeah, there's a few thousand people there, uh, but uh, and you know you try to you try to meet as many people as you can. But then we, when we were talking tonight, was the first time we realized we were both there and both, had just both flown home. That's funny. What, what what's the Creating Change Conference about? Yeah, the Creating Change. Conference is an annual conference put on by the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, um, and it covers such a large range of progressive issues. But um, is particularly attractive to youth, um, as well as movement leaders who are working towards a more just, more peaceful world. Gotcha. Great. Now, uh, Sue, you were um, part of the first graduating class from West Point uh, Military Academy. Right. That's right. Yeah, I, I entered West Point in 1976 with that first class. Wow. So at, so you graduated what about 1980 then? That's that's it's kind that's of, right. That that yes, that was a long time ago, Eric. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this was before I was born. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I work with a lot of uh, service members, so I get that a lot because they're all in their 20s. But, um, uh, you know, I was a small town kid and uh, West Point was sort of it was a dream for me. I mean, we didn't have much money. We didn't have much money for college, um, but I had decent grades and um, and, uh, you know, had been raised in a fairly conservative, you know, small town. So. So the military was was a really attractive option for me, and I was fortunate to get into West Point. I did not expect West Point to be welcoming. Uh, what was surprising to me, I was very naive about what the first class of women would face. So, so those were tough times. Those were tough times. It's quite an adjustment, uh, I'm, I'm sure, for the military to get used to women serving in that capacity. Yes. In fact, this week I'm having a, a whole sense of deja vu because uh, with the, um, the allowing, um, basically getting rid of the official ban on women in combat. I can't say allowing women in combat because that's already happened. Mm -hmm. But getting rid of the official ban on women in combat has brought up many of the arguments that were made against women at the academies. So, um, yeah, the, it, was, it was a significant move for the military. Um, on a personal level, um, it was just incredibly challenging, and uh, uh, I'm, I would never have made it through if it weren't for my faith and, uh, and the church community that I found there. Mm -hmm. I'd actually grown up Episcopalian. Um, uh, my parents were always very involved in the church. My dad was senior warden for um, a number of years, and uh, so we had a good grounding in scriptures, um, but I also learned from my parents— uh, I gained from them, I think, that just a, a solid belief in, in talking to and listening to God mm. and trying to do more listening than talking. <laughs> um, so at West Point, there wasn't much of an Episcopalian community, but the Catholic community there was very strong. Mm. And uh, I went on my first retreat as a, as a plebe, as a freshman, and um, it was a really transformative experience for me. Not that I um, hadn't felt, not that I ha didn't have um, Jesus in my life and God in my life, but just um, a real experience of being um, held and carried through that experience of West Point. So I became part of that community. In fact, I uh, was a leader in that community, not just while I was a cadet, but for years afterwards. Mm, great. Yeah. So uh Tell tell us about your 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 coming out experience, or or when what did you always know that you were gay, or how did that process work and for you? This is such an interesting story for everyone. I think everyone has their own individual story. Um, I was not ready to come to grips with my feelings um, in my youth, even at West Point. And I will tell you, if you are. Um, if you're repressing something or in denial or avoiding an issue, being a cadet at West Point is a very good way to not have to deal with it because there's so many demands on your time and so many, uh, so many stresses. And I just, I just sort of 
put these feelings in a box. I didn't date. Uh, and, and the thing is, that, was, um, that wasn't hard because the male cadets were um, fairly hostile to the women cadets. So it wasn't unusual for the women cadets to not date uh, <laughs> at all. Um, so I just never dealt with it till after I graduated. After I graduated and, you know, went out to the Army as a lieutenant and started to also have my own life back, um, I did start to deal with these feelings and start to come to grips with um, the fact that I was gay, the fact that I had these particular feelings. And once I started to come to grips with it, see, you asked me, well, you didn't know you were gay. Well, once I started to come to grips with it, I realized that a part of me had known probably since I was 11 and had an incredible crush on my sixth grade teacher. Not to say that straight people don't have crushes on same-sex teachers, but I knew deep down that that's, that was my identity. Um, but it was hard. I mean, it was hard because... Uh, it basically, my first reaction was, well, I know what the church says about this, and um, so I will just have to be celibate for the rest of my life. But I didn't feel called to celibacy. And I really started wrestling with God. You know, I, I have to say that realizing I was gay forced me to really study the Bible mm. and understand the Bible in ways that, that I hadn't before, to question, to, to really dig into what do these clobber verses mean and what is Jesus really trying to say about things that he didn't directly address. Mm -hmm. It also, when I say wrestling with God, um, my prayer life was was agonizing, but it was so much deeper. You know, I was wrestling with God on, you know, why did you make me this, this way? And why can't you fix me? And why can't you heal me? And, oh, yes, I prayed for healing. I prayed and prayed and prayed. I had, I had been very involved in the charismatic movement. You know, I believed in healing. Mm. But this, this didn't, wasn't something that was being changed or fixed or healed. Um, I actually took leave solely to fly from Germany back to New York just so I could sit down and talk with my spiritual mentor, the priest at West Point, hmm. uh, who, who, while I had been the cadet leader in that, in that Catholic retreat community, he was uh, the, the clergy leader. And I remember we went for a walk and, uh, around the barracks area and then around the plane and then around behind the cadet chapel and up the hill. I think we walked for two and a half hours and we talked about everything. And at one point he said, I know what the church preaches, but there are times when I think there is so little love in the world that how can any love be wrong in God's eyes? And I think he was wrestling because because what he said was, I have so many cadets come to me with this. And I found out later, many of the folks in our community had been gay or lesbian and had come to him. So he was trying to be as faithful to us as he could be and faithful to truth. But just that glimmer, that opening. And I'm not saying he said it's all good. It's all OK. He did not. But that glimmer of an opening allowed me to weigh okay, what if this is a sin and, and a brokenness that I need to figure out how to heal? Or what if this is a gift? Hmm. What if there is a gift in this? And the second that I allowed that in, my prayer life changed. My experience of the Holy Spirit changed. And it, 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 then it didn't take long because it seemed... It, everything came in line. Um, and I know, Eric, I, I told you this story earlier. Um, not long, about a year after that, I was a company commander in Germany. And uh, those of you who aren't military, company commander is responsible for everything. Everything their unit does or fails to do. The company commander gets called when somebody gets drunk and gets thrown in jail on a Saturday night. You get called. Pastors are, um, too. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go. comment further, though. Uh, I, I think that seems fair. Um, I got this call late on a Saturday night that one of my sergeants had tried to kill herself. And um, she wouldn't see anybody. So I kept contacting the hospital. And when they, they got back to me and said, when she heard I had asked to see her, she agreed to see me. So I go try down to the hospital. I had my little combat New Testament in my pocket, talking about fatigues. And I go up and I see, uh, see her. Let's just call her, call her Tammy. I go up to see her on the ward, the psych ward. And, uh, I start talking to her, just asking what's happening, Tammy, and she, she's crying and she's talking about it. Start this story starts to form, and first it's just about how she's betrayed her family and betrayed her God and and betrayed everyone, and she doesn't deserve to live. And I know she's very, very religious, so I try to just read the Bible, pray with her. She she couldn't, she couldn't do any of it. So the more I'm listening to the story, the more I'm getting that she's not telling me, but that I think that she's fallen in love with a woman. And she says, I'm not worthy to live, and as soon as I get out of here, I'm going to do it again, and I'm going to do it right this time, because I, I, I learned that I cut my wrist the wrong way, and, and next time I'm going to do it right. So I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I just got to be company commander. If anybody finds out I'm gay, I am out of the Army. If this ever gets out, I'm out of the Army. But... This is one of those moments of grace. And if this is the only reason that God made me gay, then so be it. So I said, Tammy, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you that God loves you. And it just so happens that I'm gay and God loves me, even so. And I know that deep in my heart. Well, it just opened the floodgates. Of course, that's what it was. Just opened everything up. She, you know, she cried and then she let me pray with her. And then uh, I left, and um, I then I went and told the, the woman that I was dating that uh, I kind of came out to this woman in the psych ward. And she's like, I'm so um, But I knew it was right. And I, that's what I said to my friend was, I said, Kathy, if this is the only reason that God laid this on my heart to save her life, praise God. That, you know, this is a blessing. It's a blessing for me. The real blessing was that she recovered. She came back. Um, she became one of my best sergeants. She stayed in the Army, retired as a command sergeant major, mm. the highest enlisted rank you can receive. And um, with two beautiful children that she and her partner have and have, are grown, and she's got grandchildren now. And... I know. And, and the, over the years, I've had the chance to be with people who were having this battle and tearing themselves apart. And, and I, I am so convicted of the truth right now, um, the, the truth of God's love that on, on this issue that um, I'm clear. And, and, and that's, that, too, is grace. So that's my story. It's a beautiful story. It sounds like uh, both of you have had a chance to uh, take a risk. Uh, on that awareness and uh, experience to increase, you know, some sense of expansion and uh, uh, the growing of the of the kingdom of God uh, within your own life and within the life of lives of others. I mean, one of the great gifts, and I'm, as I mentioned before, that I have for my parents was a belief in the living, breathing Spirit of God, that God did not end his or her interaction with us when the last word of the Bible was laid down in print, that God didn't w wipe his hands of us and say, it's all there, I'll see you, I'm going to Maui. I mean, <laughs> right. is God in Maui? That's a whole other question. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, 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 but for I, most I just of feel, I just feel that, that, that this living, breathing God, uh, Holy Spirit, is God's way of staying in communication with us, that maybe we can come to these new understandings. I loved what you said earlier about rethinking what, are women fully human? You know, the, the whole question of slavery in the 19th century where many preachers said it's right there in the Bible. You know, I think these are opportunities that were being given by the Creator 
to, to live more in his or her image. Right. I think oftentimes we forget that uh, this God that we, we worship is an incredibly generous, spirited, and loving uh, God that, that uh, it, you know, better to err on the side of grace you know, and then discover you're wrong later than to, to, to withhold uh, something well, that you feel. Yeah. One test for me is any time my impulse is more generous or more compassionate than I think God's is, I got the wrong God. <laughs> That's a good one. You know? yeah. I mean, how many people have said to me, look, I love you, but the church says that I right. can't yeah. condone you. Yeah. It's like, okay, so you are more loving than God. Right, exactly. Uh, you know, I think it solves it. Yeah, I've said before, I think that, you know, if we ever have a point, you know, after this life where we stand before our Creator and there's any kind of evaluation uh, that takes place of any kind, I doubt that for many of us, God's going to be saying, you gave away too much grace. You just gave away the story. You were, you were way too generous spirit here. You know, it's likely going to be the opposite. You know, there, and, and by you just, many orders of magnitude. You just forgave too much. I'm sorry. There's a point of forgiving. You, know, this, you got to 490, and, you, and then you kept going. Yeah, and right. I, I don't think you got it. That's right, yeah. Well, uh, speaking of keeping going, we want to keep a uh, conversation with you going, but we're going to need to break and get to uh, Justin, and then we're going to bring you both back. So if, if you're on the Internet or in the coffee house too, if you have a question uh, for Sue, uh, be sure if you're on the Internet to uh, let Morris, our social media coordinator, know that, and we'll also be taking a question from the coffee house. So, uh, Sue, we'll uh, look forward to uh, you joining us in a, in a few more moments. Thank you. I'll be standing by. Thanks, Eric. All right. Let's go to our band. You've got something wonderful to play for us. Yeah, Chuck Maronick has uh, written some brand new music, and we're very blessed that uh, we're going to get to play it. In a moment, we're going to play We Look to You, O Lord. Right now, we're going to play a, a song called Blessed Blameless. I want to introduce the fellas real quick. Matt Amandis on the keyboards, Carlos Figueroa on the drums, Steve Gomez on the bass, and here comes Carol Rogers. Blameless Who 
Well, you, Chuck just keeps writing uh, more and more incredible stuff, huh? That's great. Thanks, guys. Well, uh, Justin, it's good to be uh, joined by you this evening. That was, Thanks. I, I, you know, it was actually uh, a, a Darkwood Brew viewer is responsible for you being on. Uh, she had uh, written on the uh, Darkwood Brew Facebook page, wouldn't it be great to have Justin Lee on this series? And I had written back saying, well, actually, I've been trying to reach him, but I haven't been able to find that way. And then you jumped right in saying, here I am. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 those are the wonderful advantages of being tagged on Facebook. That's I can right. find out when people are talking about me. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, I, I keep getting tagged too, but there's not, not necessarily a flattering conversation always. But, <laughs> <laughs> no. but uh, I, I must say, I, I, I picked up a copy of your book, uh, Torn, too, and uh, really have enjoyed um, reading. I haven't read the whole thing yet, but I've read uh, substantial you know, pieces of that. And what I really appreciated um, uh, appreciate about your perspective is you come from deep in the heart of the evangelical Christian uh, community, and and write with such sensitivity and appreciation, uh, you know, for uh, those roots too. And um, can you tell us just a little bit about for those who, who may not have read your book yet or be familiar with, with you, uh, tell us a little bit about about your background. Sure. Well, first, thanks for the the compliments on the book. I really appreciate that. Um, so I grew up a conservative Southern Baptist. Um, growing up, I was, my, my nickname in high school was God Boy because I was the uber religious kid ready to witness to everybody and preach at everybody. And um, looking back, I think perhaps I was a little more obnoxious than I meant to be. Um, but, I, but my intentions were good. You know, I, I wanted to see everybody be saved and I took the, the call to evangelism uh, very seriously uh, as an evangelical, as a Southern Baptist. And um, my view on homosexuality growing up was that it was a sin, that people weren't born gay, but that people chose to be gay. And that as a Christian, I wanted to, as lovingly as possible, let people know that God had a better plan for them and encourage them not to believe the uh, the message out there in the media that gay is okay. And so I, I kind of felt like I had this all figured out. And um, uh, probably were I at the time to have access to something like Darkwood Brew and, and uh, hear this conversation going on, I would think, why are they even talking about this? It's a, it's a settled uh, deal already. But um, what I hadn't faced yet at that point was that I was gay, that from the moment that uh, I first had any sexual feelings when I first hit puberty, um, my attractions were always for guys rather than for girls. And so all my friends were becoming, uh, all my, my guy friends were becoming more and more attracted to the girls in our class. I was becoming more and more attracted to the guys, and it was freaking me out. And I kept thinking it was something I would grow out of, um, but uh, I didn't grow out of it. It just got stronger and stronger. And so I considered myself straight. I dated girls. Um, and it wasn't until I was 18 that I finally was able to admit to myself that I was gay. And, and even then I thought, okay, I'm gay insofar as I'm attracted to guys, but if I go through the right therapy, the right ministry, you know, pray enough, somehow, uh, I've got to put this behind me. I've got to become straight because that's God's plan for me. Um, and it ended up not working that way. <laughs> so you are... Uh, recount in your book uh, some kind of painful experiences after you kind of did come to, for, to terms with that in, in college and uh, with your college uh, youth group and uh, and with a particular person who came to town uh, representing an ex-gay ministry? Yeah. You, you know, the ex-gay ministries, um, I first believed were the answer, that, uh, that if you were gay and you didn't want to be, you would go to these so-called ex-gay ministries and they would help you become straight. And um, I discovered a couple of things after I came out. One is that Christians who think they're, they're being loving to gay people um, or to the broader LGBT community, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community, um, are often not being as loving as they thought. Because I thought I was being very loving. And when I ended up on the other side of those conversations, I discovered that people made a lot of assumptions about me. They would preach at me and tell me, you know, just to not be gay, which I didn't know how to be gay. Or they would preach at me about men lying with men. And I would say, I'm not lying with anybody. I'm just being honest about my attractions. But, you know, I'm not kissing anybody. I'm not holding anybody's hand. I'm just trying to figure out what God wants me to do. Um, but the other thing I discovered was that these ex-gay ministries did not work the way that I thought that they did. And, um, 
they often would try to push me into admitting that I had a terrible relationship with my parents, which must have been why I was gay. And I didn't. I actually had a really wonderful relationship with my parents. And the guy you're talking about uh, was one example. Uh, he did this presentation where he said, you know, don't believe the studies that, that suggest that, uh, that maybe there's something different in gay people's brains, that there could be something genetic or biological, because, you know, that's never been proven. It's actually, you know, a relationship with your parents. And um, during q and I said, well, you know, I have a good relationship with my parents and I'm gay and I don't know why. And he said, well, you know, uh, maybe you uh, were on an incubator as a baby and that's the reason. You know, maybe you were separated from your – I mean, this, this is really what he said. You know, the, well, you must have been separated from your parents when you were really young. And I said, well, I wasn't. He said, well, maybe you were on an incubator as a baby. I said, well, I wasn't. He said, maybe you were adopted and that was it. You know, maybe you were sexually abused, you know, and all these things. And – Eventually, I had to say, and this was in this big Christian gathering, I had to say, you know, I appreciate that you're trying to give people answers. But I feel like, you know, if I go through all the things you've said, um, and, and if, if I asked people in this room to raise their hands if they had a distant father or an abusive father or an absent father or an overprotective mother or uh, were on an incubator as a baby or separated from their parents or adopted or sexually abused or any of these things – I'm willing to bet almost everyone in this room could raise their hand for one of those at least, except me. And as far as I know, I'm the only gay person in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it was for me, it was this evidence that we as Christians, um, particularly those of us who were more conservative evangelical Christians, um, in our rush to try to provide answers because we, we didn't like sort of this issue being so unsettled, you know, in our rush to provide answers, we had oversimplified the issue and we were trying to shoehorn people into things that were not actually true. And, uh, and that really rocked me to my core. Mm. What do you uh, suppose is, the, goes to the root of that, uh, that, um, uh, you know, that angst on this issue that, and that, that, that need to provide an explanation like that, or the need to convert someone from being gay? What, what, where do you see is the root of that? Well, I think, honestly, I think it comes from a good place. Mm. I think for, for Christians who believe that same-sex sexual activity is sinful, that that's not uh, in God's plan, um, when we recognize that there are people who are gay, uh, you know, our, our first response is, at least mine was growing up, to say, well, that's a choice they made and uh, they just need to choose something different. But then once we discover, well, this person didn't choose to feel this way, they really are attracted to the same sex, they're not attracted to the opposite sex, trying to force themselves into a heterosexual marriage probably wouldn't work for them, then what we want is we want to be able to provide some solution because we say, well, gosh, I, don't, I can't support you in a same-sex marriage, and it seems that an opposite-sex marriage wouldn't work for you. There's got to be some answer I can give you that will resolve this tension for me so that I can go to sleep at night and feel good and not feel like that I'm condemning you to a life of loneliness, you know? And, uh, and so when we hear people say, oh, well, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's sexual abuse that caused it and you go through therapy and that fixes it, or it's uh, distant parents that caused it and you go through therapy and that fixes it, or if you pray enough, God will, you know, take those demons out of you and then that'll fix it, then that enables a lot of Christians to say, oh, good, now we have an answer, now I can think about other things. Um, but those answers are not real answers. And uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, whether or not Christians can ultimately, you know, I, I ultimately came to the same conclusion Sue did in terms of believing that uh, same-sex relationships can be supported by God. But I have many Christian friends who just are not there. They say, you know, I, I just can't reconcile my understanding of the scriptures with that. And, and I accept that. And, and what I would say in that case, and some of them are gay, in fact, and so they commit themselves to celibacy. But what I say is, regardless of your position on the scripture and same-sex sexual activity, the church needs to be more loving and understanding of the, the gay community and the, the larger LGBT community. Because right now, the way we're treating people uh, is, is pushing people out of the church and pushing people away from Christ. And I think that's a tragedy. Right. Yeah, it seems like even if you were, were to say, okay, this is a sin, which we were, are not saying, but if we were to say that, that your point is very well taken, uh, okay, well, then how are we going to judge the church's <laughs> act, actions towards people they regard as sinners? And, and that doesn't put the church in very good light, it seems. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, uh, one of my favorite quotes is from uh, Tony Campolo, 
who's, who talks about this phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin. Mm. And he says, you know, Jesus never said, love the sinner, hate the sin. Jesus said, love the sinner and hate your own sin. Yeah. And then when you're done dealing with your own sin, then you can, you know, worry about your brother and sister's yeah. sin. And, uh, I think I think that's a lesson that that all of us in the church uh, could stand to to learn over and over again. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if you've been seeing what what we've been seeing, but but uh, it seems that we what we've been seeing is, is quite a, a large movement in the actual evangelical Christian uh, community uh, in the parishes, not not necessarily from the leadership, but actually in the congregations themselves towards a much greater. Uh, uh, acceptance and inclusivity, uh, certainly a yearning for that, and in a sense, it's almost you know that, that the spirit is doing a, a new thing, and yet um, you know, where it feels like the heart is telling people one thing, but the head is still saying, you know, well, wait a minute, this is not what you've been taught since you've been <laughs> since you were a little little child. Even uh, what would you say to such a person who is struggling with that, feeling, sensing the spirit saying one thing, but they they have they grew up. And they've been taught by their minister and their, their church and their peers that this is a sin. Yeah, you know, in, in my work with the Gay Christian Network, I hear those kinds of messages uh, all the time. Uh, people call us all the time. And, and it's one of the reasons that I titled my book Torn, because I think so many Christians feel torn on this issue between, as you said, their hearts and their heads. And uh, I think that... You know, there's not an easy answer to that. I mean, we can sort of give these kind of cliche answers, but I think for Christians who their understanding of Scripture and what they've always been taught is really in conflict um, with what their hearts are telling them, uh, part of my answer to them is this is something that you're going to have to spend some time working through and struggling with and praying about, and it's something that we as a, as a, a body of Christ are going to have to work through together. Um, Obviously, this was something that spent that I spent many years working through and, and struggling with and going back and forth on. And there were some days that I would say, yes, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that this is the right answer. And then other days I would say, no, 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 that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And I was honestly a little afraid of coming to a conclusion that was in conflict with what I'd always believed. Sure. Because not just because, you know, it's hard to change your view on things, but because I didn't want to be leading people into sin. I didn't want to be uh, sinning myself. I didn't want to be um, led astray, you know. And uh, and this is a real fear of a lot of Christians and, and I think a lot of evangelicals. Um, but I believe if we let the Holy Spirit speak and we continue to stay in conversation with one another, um, even in the midst of these differences of opinion, as the church has been called to stay in conversation and in community, even in the midst of all kinds of other uh, theological differences of opinion over the centuries, I think one way or another we'll get through this. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's important to point out, too, that it's not just evangelical Christians who struggle with this. Most mainliners, and I grew up in the mainline church, most of us at one point in our life, you know, we, our opinions changed, you know, you know too. Um, and, you know, for myself, I wasn't always open and affirming, you know, either. Um, and it wasn't because my, my church never taught that homosexuality was a sin, but society did. And, and of course, when you're up on the playground, they're always, oh, you're gay. And, you know, there's all the, the, the language issues that just kind of enforce, you know, that you just kind of grow up a little. Of course, this is, this is uh, wrong. But I think for most uh, people who are straight, that there is... Um, they start not being uh, accepting and have to, you know, they go through a process. And I, th I think you helpfully point out that this isn't just something that where we're called to make a, a decision like, you know, in the next 30 seconds, decide that it is a process that takes time for people and you want to be prayerful and you want to, uh, to, to look at the scriptures and, 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 uh, and, and also uh, sense where the Spirit is calling you, that God has that graciousness and generosity of spirit to take time uh, with us and... Uh, and to, to, to help lead us step, you know, in baby steps oftentimes for many of us, you know, to, to uh, another point of view. And it seems like whenever the Spirit really does talk to us, it's always leading us to another point of view <laughs> because it's, its awareness is so much more higher and deeper and wider than ours is that it's always kind of shaking us up and saying, hey, just, you know, don't jump over this cliff. Just take a small step here. <laughs> you know, take another, now, okay, he did that. Now take another small step here. Um, and keep clearing up with me. Keep asking, hey, am I, am I wrong or am I right? Am I going the right direction or am I not? You know, and mm -hmm. uh, and step by step, we we uh, our awareness changes. Absolutely, and ultimately, for straight Christians, 
um, I feel like it's not always important that you have all the answers. I think one of the things that many of us as Christians have to learn how to say is, I don't know. And there are a lot of passages in Scripture that if you ask me, why did Jesus say this? Or why did God allow this? Or why did this happen? Why is this in the Scripture? My best answer to you is, I have no clue. I have no idea. But, um, uh, you know, I'm going to keep studying it, and I'm going to keep seeking God's heart, and I'm going to keep trying to understand better. And in the meantime, on those issues I don't know about, and, the, you know, the questions people might ask where I don't know how to advise them, the best thing I can do is to love them and to, to just be there and say, I, I don't know if you're doing the right thing or not. Yeah. But regardless, I love you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be there for you and be your friend um, because that's what God's called me to do. Excellent. Well, Justin, uh, we want to uh, uh, we're going to take a, a little break here, go to the band, uh, kind of let people process what they've heard so far, and then we want to jump back uh, with you and with Sue Fulton and uh, uh, allow you, you both to kind of uh, respond to each other and also to respond to questions uh, from the Coffeehouse community and the Internet. Thanks. Cool.
done beautifully. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, guys. And thanks, Chuck Moronick, once again. Well, it's good to have you uh, both back. This is the, actually the first time ever in Darkwood Brew history when we've been on for a bit over two years that we've had two Skype guests on at the exact same time. So you are, you are, breaking, ground brew, you are breaking Darkwood Brew history tonight. Uh, Ain't technology grand. That's right. Well, <laughs> we're going to cross our fingers. It doesn't fail on us. <laughs> so uh, first time for everything. There's a first time for failing at everything, too. So, But... Uh, <laughs> So uh, you both had a chance to kind of um, uh, be monitoring uh, the episode. And before we take any questions from the coffee house and the, uh, the Internet community, just wanted to give you uh, each a chance to uh, respond to what you've seen so far or, or each other's conversation or add anything that, that you felt you didn't quite get in <laughs> the first conversation. I think Justin's incredibly patient with people. Um, I, I and it may be um, I, I come from a, a a different place, not coming from an evangelical background. But I, I, yes, it was a, a very difficult process for me. And I find, but I find as I get older, I have less patience with. People. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm saying it's a bad thing. I have less patience with people who say, "I just can't get there." It's kind of like. We'll get there, you know. So, so God bless you for because we need people to 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 be to have that compassion and and to to be willing to stick with people through their struggles and even if they don't get there and they've just decided that somebody else's life is theirs to judge, that that's okay. Yeah. You know, well, that, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was going to say I, I I appreciate that. I also think though that that the church needs uh, agitators. I mean, Jesus was, uh, was an agitator. Jesus spent, you know, when he, I think it's interesting that the people Jesus hung out with were the sinners and the outcasts and the people that all the religious folks looked down on. And You and, are reading my notes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Jesus saves his harsh words. You know, we never, we never see Jesus uh, preach a sermon, you know, condemning uh, a, a group of, of sinners, aside from when he preaches against the religious leaders who are the ones looking down on everybody else. Those are the folks that he's upset with and the folks he uh, calls sons of hell, which, you know, if the son of God calls you a son of hell, I think that's probably not a good thing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. You know, but even, even that, you know, to stick up for those uh, sons of hell, you know, too, I, I think that, that, um, that even when Jesus is doing that, I get this sense from him that he's not actually condemning them in, the, in that particular way, but saying, you're better than that. You're bigger than that. What are you thinking? Come on. <laughs> you know, it's it's a, from a, a perspective of intense belief, even in them, to say, hey, you know, wake up. You know, uh, wake up to your true identity and your true connection to the, to the divine, too. But maybe that's just wishful thinking. I don't know. <laughs> well, snakes and vipers brood to me is a, is also strong language. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, I don't know uh, about no, you, but I, I, I do find I do find it interesting. I mean, the 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 gospels. You can almost see Jesus almost rolling his eyes whenever the Pharisees are like, "Okay, so it's on the Sabbath, and it's before the sun goes down." And somebody's going to starve to death. It's like, oh, yeah. all right, okay. <laughs> but, but to your point, Justin, he finds the answer that sends away scratching their heads. Like, okay, we got to get a better problem, you know. So I, I guess there there are lots of ways. There are, there are better ways to respond than impatience. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it does seem like you know even the people we're close to don't we talk trash the most of the people we're closest to? You know, come on, you idiot. What are you thinking? Hey, wake <laughs> up, you know. And I'm not trying to make Jesus and the Pharisees all lovey-dovey, but I, I do think that, um, that oftentimes the, the Pharisees are, you know, we think that Jesus only ever hated them or, or was always in conflict with them. But he, these were the group of people. He wasn't talking to the Sadducees or the Essenes particularly, which were the two other big groups of religious leaders. He was talking to the Pharisees mostly because they kept inviting him to dinner. They kept on asking, you know, seeking him out late at night and, and so forth. And you tend to have disputes with those who you are closest to, you know, not those who you completely written off. But I, I do think that uh, a lot of Jesus is, you know, you brood of vipers and all that is actually coming from a, a point of, of appreciation of where they're coming from. He was actually more uh, spiritually in alignment with Pharisees than he would have been with the Essenes or the, uh, the Sadducees and saying, hey, would you just take the stuff that you already say you're taking seriously, seriously, 
you know. But anyway, that's just my point of view. But uh, <laughs> so, uh, but also to your point too about the uh, the different communities, I would say that that uh, you know, for myself, for instance, on the on the gay issue, I needed the person who would just kind of be friendly and take their time with me. But then when it came to, for instance, uh, women's equality, and I always considered myself to be a supporter of women's equality, but I had no idea how many patriarchal values I imported into that until seminary, when some pretty angry feminist uh, uh, theologians in seminary said, hey, what are you thinking? You know, to not just me, but you know, a lot of us. <laughs> and it's like, what am I thinking? Good point. You know, we, sometimes we need to be shaken up and sometimes we need to be loved to death, you know. Well, speaking about shaken up or loved, why don't we go to uh, a question. I think that um, uh, Trace uh, Morris has uh, one. He's been monitoring our internet chat, which seems to be flying by here uh, during this episode. So, Morris, uh, you have a question for one of our guests? Or Lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> My first one for, um, is for Justin. Justin, a uh, question from David Speria online. Can you explain the difference between orientation and behavior? Sorry, can I explain the difference between orientation and behavior? Yes. Sure. Uh, yeah, so I talk about this uh, some in, in, in my book and a lot of times when I talk to um, Christian audiences that um, it's interesting how we all use words like gay or bi, and, and we kind of assume that we all know what these words mean and that we're all speaking the same language, and sometimes we're not. Typically, when gay people uh, use the term gay, they use it to refer to somebody's orientation, their attractions. So somebody who is attracted to the same sex, it would be gay, and somebody who's attracted to the opposite sex would be straight, and somebody who's attracted to both sexes would be bi. Um, sometimes I talk to Christians who assume that because uh, somebody calls themselves gay that that means that they're uh, having sex with people of the same sex, which may or may not be true. Just as when someone says that they're straight, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're having sex uh, with anybody, uh, nor does it necessarily mean that they're not having sex with anybody. But, you know, if a, if a, a 14 year old girl um, notices that the boys in her class are cute, we would say that she's straight, but we would hope that she's not having sex with them. Um, similarly, if she notices that the girls in her class are cute, then we would say that she's gay or lesbian. Um, so, so those words refer to uh, attractions or orientation, um, which may or may not coincide with somebody's sexual behavior. Somebody might be Sexual, somebody might be married to a member of the opposite sex and not attracted to members of the opposite sex. They might be gay, even if they're in an opposite sex relationship or vice versa. So, right. Good. Thanks. Uh, Tracy, I think, had a... Oh, there we go. Yes, uh, I wanted to make a comment about um, when I read my Bible, which I've been reading for 40 years, and I see that all the way through the Bible, homosexuality or sodomy or whatever you want to call it, is a sin... And then we get to the year 2013, and now we're going to say, no, it's not. We, we've misunderstood that for, whatever, five, 7,000 years, that now God's changing his mind. Um, he wiped out Sodom and Gomorrah, and you can say for whatever reason, uh, inhospitality, or he wiped out the Benjamites in the book of Judges for the same type of behavior. But now we're going to say that, uh, you know, that's not a sin. Maybe God made a mistake back there. Um, and I look in the in First Corinthians, and I got it. We talked about it last week. The laundry list of sins in there, you know, talks about you are thieves and covetous and drunkards, et cetera, et cetera. He doesn't say you know you were born that way. He says you are. And then in First Corinthians six eleven, he says, "And such were some of you." And that's a beautiful thing. That's the hope for us as Christians. I was born an adulterer and a murderer and a thief. Yeah, it's called sin. I was born that way. But thank the Lord, because now I'm a born-again Christian, I don't practice those things. I have the potential to do that, but I don't practice them. And I'm, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, and I love people, and I, I love sinners, but I'm not going to affirm them in their behaviors. If my best friend is committing adultery on his wife, I'm not going to pat him on the back and say, well, you were born that way. Go ahead and do it. So, so I have a real problem with you know, affirming something that is clearly uh, from a Christian and a biblical standpoint. Since this is on the Bible and homosexuality, I have a problem with affirming that particular behavior. So what was your question for their guests? Or? My question would be, how, how can you 
how can you deny five to seven thousand years of God's judgment on this sin and many others, you know, killing innocent people and things like that? How can you affirm that? Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Well, we, are, are we going to deal with each and every verse? Um, no, I, no, I think, I think uh, maybe we'll just take the question at the end. Uh, okay. I, so I I, I, well, yeah, I mean, I think uh, th th as we're making history with your two guests, I think this is where we're going to run into trouble is the back and forth. Um, you know, there are, what, a million verses in the Bible and roughly seven or nine, is it, Justin, that address either men lying down with men or, or, or Six, boys or, okay. Um, it, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of the Bible. I know you guys have covered this in previous weeks and I haven't watched it and I don't want to get down into the, the weeds, but biblical scholars have explicated this over and over much better than I have, that there is nothing in the Bible that addresses an adult equal relationship with two same, two people of the same gender loving each other and building a home and a family. That's not addressed in the Bible. And the verses that you're talking about, we can talk about each one, but I don't think we want to use up the time doing that. And so I would say, no, God hasn't made a mistake. Humans have made a mistake. Yeah. I'll, I'll, add, I'll add just one quick uh, comment, too, which is, in some ways, for me, this kind of goes back to the, the, the previous question about behavior and orientation. Um, you know, as I said, I, I know many people, including many gay Christians, who believe that those passages do uh, condemn gay sex. Uh, Sue and I uh, don't believe that, but I used to believe that. Um, but, but even if you do, as, as the gentleman who just uh, asked the question does, um, I would say this. I am not asking you, uh, Sue might be, but I, yeah, I, I am not asking you to change your, uh, your view on that. What I am asking is for the church to be more loving to gay people. Because what I discovered was when I realized I was gay, meaning that I was attracted to guys, I had not acted on that. I was not having sex with anybody. I was not dating anybody. But just the acknowledgement that I felt this attraction was enough to get me kicked out of churches, kicked out of Christian groups, disowned by Christian friends and, and so forth. And that we would not respond that way to people who experience, let's say, let's call it a temptation. We would not res respond that way to people experiencing any other kind of temptation. This issue gets people singled out, not because of what they're doing, because we don't really know what they're doing. I have no idea what Sue does or ever has done or ever will do in bed, and I don't need to know. That's, we're not on that kind of you know, level. But, but we get, we get uh, this kind of uh, discrimination sometimes from Christians on the basis of what we feel, and that's different. Yeah, yeah. I think this is there is an important distinction. I don't. Again, I won't take too much time, but there's an important distinction here. I had the most when I was working on the appeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I was part of a working group, um, and uh, one of the an army sergeant major kept raising the question of, "Yeah, but what about the showers?" And this sitting next to me was a. Um, uh, commander in the Royal Navy, straight, married, and she slams her hand down on the table and said, when are you going to understand it's not about sex? <laughs> and I, you know, I had this moment of, I wish I could just explain that to people that, especially don't ask to tell, you know, it, it, when it gets reduced to sex, who, what couple would want their marriage reduced to sex? Right. If they bring, you know, is your wedding album, you know, all about sex? It's, <laughs> it's about. <laughs> well, I, I mean, uh, I. I you know, I, my part, my wife, partner and I, I stumbling over wife because we only got married in December. We've been together for 17 years, and it's about arguing about it's about arguing about the chores. It's about the difficult decision of whether to raise children. It's about whose photo is on your if you're talk, on your desk. If you're talking about young troops overseas, it's about who's waiting for them back home. It's about you know breakups and first dates. It's about life. And, and I think that one of the, I think one of the humps that's hard to get over for, for people who, who aren't close to, who don't have gay and lesbian friends is they have this vision that this is about 
uh, some kind of sexual act. And, and I would just, just say to take a moment and think about your own beloved and how much of that is about sex and how much of that is about life and love. Yeah. Amen. That's all it is. Excellent. Uh, well, I, re I think that's a, a point we're going to end, actually, uh, uh, our, our conversation for this, this evening. It's an excellent place to end on. It, it's about uh, love. And uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us. You've, you've offered us something very personal from your hearts and also uh, given us something to expand our own understanding of, of uh, uh, particularly from the standpoint of those who are most directly affected by uh, this issue. So uh, thanks for joining us. Both of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that you know, uh, in my own response to that, that that question too is is I would you know if you if that is a question about how we uh, you know, say in the year 2013 you know or you know actually it's been said for a lot longer than this but that there is uh, we do have greater awareness here. Um, I think that if that's if that's something that that you struggle with too, I, I would ask though, um, where did where do we stand on usury? Where do we stand on charging interest on loans, for instance? Uh, the Bible has ten times more to say about charging interest on loans. In fact, far more than ten times to say on that against that than anything that could even remotely touch on same-sex attraction. Um, and when you want to answer the question about why we are charging interest on loans as Christians and feeling that's a good and right thing, then we can have a discussion about why we're changing, our, our, why we are responding to a, a new thing God is saying about homosexuality. But bottom line is, that's not the final word in any of this. Um, I think for Christians, uh, the final word on, on issues that divide us, and this isn't the first issue that's divided Christians. We've been divided about race, and we've been divided about women. We've been divided about people of other nationalities. We've been divided about immigration, all kinds of issues. But the final word really comes down to this among Christians. The final word comes down to the one that we all turn to wherever we are on this issue, who lived 2,000 years ago and sitting amongst friends, not all of whom agreed with each other around that table, said, my friends, uh, this, this is my body, which is being broken uh, for you, for you. Do this as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. He said, my friends, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. By eating this bread and drinking this cup, we remember Christ's death. We celebrate Christ's resurrection and we come to know that in any area of life where we feel so doggone certain and righteous about, um, that ultimately we all stand before the cross on level ground, on common ground, on ground that, that is deeper and wider than the divisions that separate us. And that if we in our divisions will keep on eating this meal together, refusing to, to step away from that table, refusing to, to deny fellowship to this table uh, to those we disagree with. If we'll keep eating together and breaking bread together and acknowledging the one who did this and the meaning behind it, uh, step by step, the Spirit shows us the way forward. And we look back and we think, gosh, won't we silly about this, all this fighting we did. We find a new unity, a new common ground, a new way to move forward in Christ's name. If you're joining us on the internet tonight and have a bread and wine or juice and crackers at home, we will invite you to share in this meal. Those of you in the coffee house have uh, communion stations around you. We invite you to share uh, with each other and, and distribute the elements uh, as we take communion together, saying uh, the bread of life, the cup of blessing. Let us enjoy the feast together wherever we stand.
I don't know about you, but I've certainly felt fed uh, tonight, uh, cup overflowing, uh, great music, great, uh, uh, very reflective guests as well. Uh, if you have uh, benefited from this episode and, and wanted to uh, explore further, we invite you to join us uh, next week, where we'll be joined by Bishop Jean Robinson, the first openly gay bishop elected in the Episcopal Church, uh, now years and years ago, in fact, so many years ago. Uh, that he just retired uh, about a month ago. Uh, and he is an incredibly generous-spirited uh, individual. You'll absolutely uh, probably fall in love with him uh, next week if you uh, care to join us. Uh, just an incredibly uh, bright and, um, and person that's full of God's love and grace. So, but until then, my friends, may the Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ our Lord, go before you to show you the way. Go above you to watch over you. Go behind you to push you into places you may not necessarily go yourself, but will with the Spirit's guidance. Go beneath you to uphold you and uplift you. Go beside you to be your strong companion and dwell within you to remind you that you are surely not alone. You are loved, loved beyond your wildest imagination. And may the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you now and always. Amen. <laughs>